was uh, last here in uh, April. I, I think one or two in the audience will have heard some of the things I've said, so I apologize in advance for that. But we were there on that occasion to launch with Tony Addison uh, a major UN-wider project on extractive industries and the development of low- and middle-income countries. And what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit more global than um, either the presentation of EB or, or, or Wisdom. Uh, try to sort of global context, but I'm going to sort of pick bit, bits and pieces from this um, work that we're doing. We, we now have something like 30 authors uh, and contributors signed up, and there will be some working papers hitting the wider website by the end of this year. Uh, I've got 15 minutes. I can't do justice to 30 papers of distinguished authors in that time, but I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick some. 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes. Oh, gosh, thank you. So open. Thank you very much. Let me just sort of uh, kick off here. Um, this is the introduction, but it's also some of the priors about the wider project I mentioned. Uh, the first one is that there's been, uh, over the last 20 years, an undoubted increase in dependence of extractive industries in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, this is a statistical fact, which I'll illustrate in just a moment. And, of course, that rising dependence has, has generated far interesting new um, challenges for, for countries, uh, low- and middle-income countries. Um, about how to best to manage the uh, volatility, which uh, Ibi has talked about in the context of Nigeria, but also how to generate the longer-term benefits. Uh, the risks, we are obviously very clear. Ibi's presentation illustrates them very forcefully. The macroeconomic risks associated with the volatility of the prices um, and the management tasks associated with that. They are, they are very, very demanding and very, very difficult. But in the book and in the project, we're looking also... I think with more uh, emphasis on the societal risks, the, the failure that we've seen in many countries of extractive industries, by which I mean minerals plus oil and gas, to <coughs> generate sustainable development, which is also broadly inclusive, uh, not only for the uh, communities in the vicinity of mining and oil and gas activity, but for broader, broader uh, societies within a country. And of course, the, the test for that um, sustainability is that um, if you're extracting a depletable, exhaustible resource, then as a minimum, you're, you need to create capital, whether physical or human, which is at least equal to the resource you're, you're, you're um, exploiting. So we're going to look at some dimensions of that. And I think the, one of the other prizes is that although it's extremely important, and the Nigerian discussion draws attention to that, the, the literature has, has given really a very strong emphasis to issues of Dutch disease and the macroeconomic ills that can come with... Uh, high dependence on oil and gas and, and minerals. And we're not saying it's unimportant, we will address that in the project, but we want to address these broader complex risk issues for society um, of the type I, I've mentioned uh, um, with, with a little bit more attention perhaps than has been done in, in other uh, pieces of work. Um, so let's start with a couple of facts about the macro risks. Um, the first is this point about increasing dependency. The, these are data on exports as a percent, mineral exports only, as percentage of total exports, uh, you can see that um, here I've got the, the 15 countries in the world which are most dependent as of 2014, which is the latest data we have. We have some pretty striking numbers, Botswana 91%, Congo 78%, um, Mo Mo Mauritania 58% and so on. All of those top 15 countries are low and middle income countries, except one, the one uh, is, is uh, Chile, which was a lower a middle income, oh, sorry, middle income country, not uh, so long ago, and if we extended this list to the next, um, uh, the next uh, 20 or so countries, most of those also are lower middle income countries. Undoubtedly very high dependence. Um, oil and gas, similar, you see in the same ranking of um, oil and gas countries, uh, countries like Algeria and uh, Nigeria and Angola, there are a few more high income countries there because we've got the Middle Eastern countries, but very high dependence. If we put this all together, and this is in a paper I've done with Samantha Dodd, um, we found 72 low and middle income countries in 2014 that have an export dependency on minerals or oil and gas of at least 30% of total exports. Of those 72, 18 are low income countries, uh, 25 are low middle income countries. And the, I think the more important fact is possibly that over the last 20 years, that dependency has increased for most of those countries. Um, at the percentage point increase in dependency between 1996 and 2014 has been 17. It's not 17 percent, this is 17 percentage points uh, on average, a simple weighted average of those 72 countries. Now we looked at what are the commodity shocks um, 
from 2011 and 12 had done to this. We don't have the data, unfortunately, for all the countries to do this properly, but that 17% uh, as of uh, for the period of 2014 was actually 18% if you stop the, uh, the calculation of 2013. So there has been a little bit of reduced dependency, if you like, in the statistical sense associated with the falling commodity prices that we, we've seen in the last two or three years. Um, but that dependency also is interpreted or manifest as revenue dependency. The data here is very poor. You know, the, the IMF has been working for a long time, but they still only produce consistent data on mineral revenues on a consistent basis for a limited number of countries. We can't do it for all countries, but we, we get the data from national organizations. We, here we've got some countries, and you see these numbers are pretty high. Again, Botswana is up there uh, with something like 40%. We've got Guinea, 23%, Mongolia. Uh, Chile is here as well, but, and, and Zambia as well. Um, so mineral de revenue dependency of governments um, is also high in, uh, in minerals. These bars uh, tell you the variability over time. So you take a case of Zambia, which I know quite well, um, as a minimum in the period from 2000 to 2013, Zambia revenue uh, from minerals was as low as 3% of government revenue, but as high as 30%. The variation between 3 and 30 percent within a, within a span of only 13 years. Now, uh, a casual observer looking at that, as I did initially, said, well, that's all to do with volatility. But volatility of prices is only one part of that, the explanation. And a more important part, certainly in the case of Zambia, is the life cycle stage that we're in with the mining industry. So in, t in, the, year, in the year 2000, Zambia was just embarking on a, a new way of huge investments associated with privatization, which took place at the end of the 1990s. Most of the mining industry that we, is now in place in Zambia, the copper mining, was not producing any revenue, any profits in the early years. Of, so the revenue from gov government was very low, but by 2011-12, it was up to 30%. And there was a huge political debate in, in Zambia in the middle of the, the 2000s saying, the, these mines are all there investing heavily, but where's the revenue for government? The answer was, it's there, but it hasn't yet arrived. It arrived only um, by 2011-12, where unfortunately there was a price collapse and, and it went down again uh, in the subsequent few years. So revenue dependency is high. Um, the second fact about dependency and the, the risks and the lead into crisis that can arise is to do with volatility of prices. Now this is a chart which is familiar, I think. This is metal prices, a number of metals, iron ore, aluminium and so on. And we, we see the dip in prices that have took place after around about I date this from about the middle of the year 2011, but it, it's different for different metals. The price fall is quite clear. And that gives countries that are heavily dependent on, on, on minerals uh, cause for pause. You know, is this an industry we, want, we really want to be in for the longer term? But th th that question is much more complex when you look at the longer term. Because th this is the same uh, basic information, and that's the period I just showed in the previous chart, but if we take the long period from 1960 to 2014 instead of that shorter period I just showed you, you see that metals prices even today are much higher than they were uh, through a large part of this 65-year uh, period, 55-year period. And the same is true with, uh, with um, crude oil. Uh, if you look at crude oil prices, this is from one of the papers for our, our project by Paul Stevens from Chatham, Chatham House. Um, if you look at the story from 1980 to 2014, uh, you, you look at the mean average uh, price of crude oil in this period of the 80s and the, and the 90s, and it's, it's very, very much lower than the price that we have today. It's so around about 20, this is in nominal dollars, so it's about $30. Now we're up to uh, something like 40, which we're all crying about because it's a dramatic falling price. If we pointed that out, and it is, you know, if you've been expecting 112, but it's not in long-term context, it's not, uh, it's not a low price. So this is one of the dilemmas you have if you're a country that is producing a product like oil. What is the future going to be? And if you take a very long view, this is from the 1800s, 1860, I can hardly read this myself, um, up to the present time. This is the price uh, in today's um, money, and this is the, these charts are in 2013 dollars. This is the price of crude oil. So I'm not going to bet my pension on what's going to happen next. I suspect it would be a very bad bet. And, and who, else, who else would bat the pension, pension on what's going to happen next to the price of crude oil? So these uncertainties are in, endemic in this, these industries and very important. And then my next point is, can these macro price risks be managed? And we, we've seen, and Ibi has given us a very you know, clear example of the problems of the last two or three years in countries like Nigeria, Nigeria but also in 
Venezuela and, and Ghana. We know these, these situations have been dramatic. Countries have lost fiscal revenue. They've needed large fiscal adjustments. They've had substantial exchange rate depreciation, higher inflation, and of course, slower growth. And in some countries like Venezuela, you know, really serious political turmoil associated with that. Can the risk be managed? The answer is yes, technically they can be managed. But the evidence is that in most lower and middle income countries, they have not managed very well. And I, I hope Peter will forgive me, and I'm going to contrast Ghana with Chile briefly. Um, it's a fairly dramatic comparison. This is Ghana. Um, Ghana got oil, or discovered oil in 2007. It started pumping in 2012. Before that, in 2004, Ghana had had HIPAA debt relief, which reduced its debt burden from 100% of GDP to something like 30%. So the, the interest payments in, in the budget of the government were dramatically reduced in 2004. And then we started getting the oil coming along. This is the fiscal deficit of, of, of Ghana, 2011, 4% of GDP. By 2012, up to almost 12% of GDP. Now, this was before the oil price started to fall. You know, and when the oil price started to fall, these problems became much greater. And of course, Ghana did a number of things. It went out on the back of its newly found oil and raised money in the sovereign debt markets very quickly. The interest burden went up. Arguably, the terms of that borrowing were extremely unfavorable. Um, and if you then look at the budget composition of expenditure, you find that by 2015, this is a projection, not, not the actual figure. Peter may know the actual figure. But um, that figure was something like 5 or 6% of GDP when committed just to interest payments. This was far higher than the revenue from oil. So the new oil quickly translated into a a problem for Ghana rather than a success. You can compare that with um, Chile. Andre, Andre Solimano is here, so I'm really hesitant to talk about this, but let me do it. I'm sure I shall make some terrible mistakes, but he'll, he will kindly point them out to me afterwards. Um, this was Chile in the period 2000 to 2010. Um, this was a period of the, oh, I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. This was a period when copper prices were rising very dramatically. This was the so called super cycle in, in full swing. Um, the copper prices are calibrated on, on that axis, and you see they were going from something uh, 200 to something like over 300. In that same period, fiscal surpluses in Chile, uh, as a percentage of GDP, went up to six or more percent of GDP. What happened when we had the global fiscal, uh, financial crisis in 2009? Uh, Chile ran a, a, a deficit. The copper price went down by something like 50 percent, but uh, that was a response of fiscal terms, a pro cyclical. Um, a, a response uh, on, in the part of the, the, the budget. And um, there was an amazing, I think this is an amazing statistic. Andre, we had a little discussion in the bar the other night. I, Chile was able in 2009 to put the equivalent of nearly 3% of GDP uh, as a fiscal expansion into the economy. It, it didn't stop growth being slightly negative, but it was only slightly negative. And it was far higher than what was achieved in neighboring in Brazil and far higher than in most European countries not these countries like Greece and Portugal and Spain, where there, there was the opposite, there was an austerity budget. So that contrast is a very dramatic one, but it does tell us that technically we, do, we can do this. Now, whether Ghana did something's right and something's wrong, whether Chile should have had as much as money set aside as this, these are debates, but the stabilization can be done and has been done in, in some cases. Um, the problem now, let's turn to the longer term. What do we do? with these natural resources in the longer term. I mean, there is a, an, an increasing, I think, uh, body of opinion that says that we've had the resource curse. We know all about it. it we've got <coughs> disaster stories all over the place. You know, we should keep it in the ground. We've got a pressure to keep it in the ground, which is linked to climate change, if, if you're talking about uh, things that connected to uh, climate change. That's one solution. But that's not going to happen in lower and middle income countries, I predict. Comfort I would bet my pension on that statement. Um, this is a, I can't remember where I got this from. This, these are logarithmic scales. This is per capita income of um, a variety of countries. And this is the per capita value of the re known reserves of natural resources, um, including metals and, and oil and gas. Uh, there are lo logarithmic scales. This is the sort of um, unity line. And a simple uh, glance at that tells you very quickly that most of the many low income countries, Mozambique is there, Tanzania here, is, is here, Nigeria is here, they have per capita resources already known about in the ground, far, far, a multiple of their per capita income. These are poor countries. These are not going to keep these resources in the ground unless there is some sort of dramatic change in, in global governance that somehow 
bribes them to do it in a, in a really big way. So I think that's the first important fact. Guinea, I think, is a dramatic case. You know, it has one quarter of the world's total reserves of bauxite, one quarter of the total reserves. It's most are high grade, most unexploited, but it only produces at the level of China and India that only have one tenth of the known reserves that uh, the Guinea has. So Guinea is not going to leave that bauxite permanently in the ground over the next 20, 30, 40 years. So I think that's the first point um, on, on the longer term. The potential is huge. But we, if we look at what countries have done in the past with this, this, these reserves, the, the results have been, as we know, pretty disappointing, but not unambiguously bad. They've not been unambiguously bad. This is a graphic from the McKinsey Global Institute, which shows the, um, this is the per capita growth rate of countries that they define as resource dependent, slightly different from extractives, and slightly different from what I've been talking about. So this per capita compound growth rate between 95 and 2011, and this is the per capita income. In this block here, we've got this average income. Countries in this group, in that, in that area there, are basically falling behind. Their per capita income growth compound was not sufficient to, as it were, um, raise, um, raise their overall um, uh, income. But there were 37% of the countries that were catching up. You know, they, they were leaping ahead, if you like, in terms of catching up with richer countries in that period of time, on the back of natural resources. McKinsey wrote this study in 2013, and they come up with this really dramatic thing. It was, of course, before prices started to fall big time. But they say if, if the countries that fell behind could have replicated those that were sort of doing really quite well with natural resources, this would have had the potential to have taken something like two or three hundred million people out of poverty in the countries concerned over a 20 year period. Now that's sort of in the same ballpark as the poverty reduction we've seen in China, which everyone says has been absolutely amazing. So we can't write off natural resources as, as a complete and utter disaster. There are countries that have done reasonably well with it, uh, and there are countries that have, have not. The key then, and this is where I think the project that Tony and myself are, are running is going to be making a contribution, is how do we build success, how do we build the institutions and the capacity in more of these poorly performing countries to do well with the long term, to build the inclusivity, to make sure the communities affected by mining are indeed benefiting. Macro management is important, and it, but it's only one limited dimension of this problem. There are other management challenges, policy challenges, and the problem is there are a lot of them. And the problem for a country, I work a lot in Tanzania, the problem is they need a lot of coordination. And we've counted up in relation to managing oil and gas in Tanzania, something like 12 government ministries that ought to be involved. And there ought to be coordination, but there isn't coordination. Because the Ministry of Mines said, well, Mines and Petroleum thinks, well, it's gas, so it's us up to do with us. So they don't sort of involve other departments in the way they should. The Natural Resource Governments into has done a great job, I think, in articulating through its through the Natural Resource Charter and through the questionnaires which they use to benchmark countries in terms of performance and governance institutions, the areas in which work is needed. And I've listed just a few here, but not by no means all. The broad strategy for the long term, what you do with the mineral resource or the oil and gas, the legal structures, the contracting, the licensing, the, the geological databases, the setting the taxes, not just collecting them, but collecting is important. And then when you've collected them, what do you do? Public expenditure management. Do you, so what do you do with a, a windfall gains in public expenditure? Regulating the environment, community development. There's a long, long list. This is only about a third of it. Um, but under all of those, there are some very, very important sort of uh, points to be done. Now, um, how are we going to get there? Well, this is uh, a sort of little scenario setting thing that Tony and myself are starting to work on. It's very embryonic. But the basic idea that uh, it, uh, action is needed both in relation to government, which is defined on that axis, but also in terms of the companies, the mining companies or the oil and gas companies. And we've simplified it. You know, at the top here, we've got governments are very, very effective in, broad, in most senses uh, I've just described on the previous slide. They're also inclusive. These are not governments that are sort of um, discriminated against <coughs> ethnic groups or minorities or particular regions or particular communities. They're, they're doing their best to be inclusive. Okay. They may not be perfect, but they're, they're, they're doing their best. At the other extreme, we've got what we've called warlords, governments which are clearly ineffective. You know, they're, not, they're not doing well in any of those areas that I put on the previous slide. And they're probably extremely divisive. You know, their work is favoring particular ethnic groups or particular regions or particular parts of their societies. 
And then we've got a similar mapping of companies, the enlightened companies that, can occur, that comply with international standards that are increasingly emerging. And we've got, I describe them as the, you know, the mining country, companies of 100 years ago. Um, Anglo, uh, not, uh, what's it called, anglo Godashanti and Awasi in Ghana, for example. You know, it was started 100 years ago. You go there now, it looks like it, you know, it's still quite frozen 100 years ago. Companies like, like that. And we've got a spectrum. And what we need to surmise is where countries locate in that mapping, the four zones. And we don't know. We do know in terms of government because we've got very good measurements of government effectiveness from both the World Bank but also Natural Resource Governments Institute. So we, we know that um, a lot of governments, uh, low-income, middle-income countries, are down here. You know, they're not perfect, but they're not bad. We don't have the same mapping for companies, so we have to sort of surmise. But the first, I've, I've run out of time, so this is, this is my last, more or less my last slide. Um, what we do know that if, we, if we've got uh, governments and enlightened companies in that sort of broad area, reasonably in, inclusive governments and reasonably enlightened companies, all of these international initiatives that have happened, and this is from where I get great hope, because in the last, uh, in the period since 2000, Tony Hodge, who has written a paper for this um, book I keep referring to, has identified 46 separate international initiatives of various types that are all designed in different ways to contribute to this institution building or government's improvement that we're arguing is needed to get this more inclusive benefits from mining and extractive resources. 46. Things like the Natural Resources Charter, the IFC Sustainability Principles, the Principles of the International Council on Mining Metals, ideas from the African Mining Vision, from the Responsible Mining and Global Economic Forum and so on. Now, if, so if it's the case that our countries are located there, I'm out of time, I'm really finishing, where I, I put those charts, this is a surmise, you know, the governments aren't bad, but the, the companies aren't too bad. It seems to me that these international initiatives can be extremely effective and that they will make a difference. And they're all very recent. This is only the last 15 years. Um, if, of course, you've got um, situations down here where the governments are really divisive, warlords, and you've got rogue com companies, then forget it. These initiatives are pretty much a waste of time. Extractive industry, transparency initiative, in, you know, civil strife, country, poor companies, it's not going to do anything. It's just, it's just a window dressing. So I stopped there. Um, the last slide is a pretty one. That's why I left it on there as the last. This is the NRGI um, rate ranking of countries in terms of governments. Most of the ones we're interested in, I think, in this room, certainly based on the previous presentation, are in Africa. And unfortunately, it corresponds to what I said. They don't quite meet the standards being effective governments. They're not warlords. Most of them, or many of them, are not. Um, but they have a long way to go, if you like, in meeting the uh, standards of good governments that NRGI perceives to be uh, desirable. Thank you very much indeed.